This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, a closer look at Project Lift and efforts to narrow the achievement gap among students in Charlotte's west side. Plus, how does Charlotte keep big events like the CIAA tournament and all those tournament dollars coming back to town? We'll have more on selling Charlotte as a tourist destination coming up. And what's an honorary consul? Find out how they sell the Charlotte region internationally. It all starts right now on Carolina Impact. WTBI PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by the Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. Charlotte Tourism is a $4.6 billion a year industry, supporting 47,000 jobs in hotel and restaurant businesses, according to the Charlotte Regional Visitors Authority. Now, those officials are in the business of luring trade shows to the convention center, big sporting events to the stadium and Time Warner Cable Arena, bringing visitors and their wallets to town. Who is Charlotte's competition for all those out of town big spenders? And is what we spend to bring them here worth it? Carolina Impact's Jeff Saunier joins us now, and he went out looking for answers, starting at the arena uptown. Hey, Jeff, why there? Well, Amy, here at Time Warner Cable Arena, we get Hornets games, we get lots of live concerts and other big events, but nothing quite matches the excitement of CIAA tournament basketball. And for the folks who sell Charlotte as a destination for tourism or conventions, well, there's nothing quite like the economic impact either of five days of the CIAA. <laughs> Yeah, the bands are loud, and while you may not be wowed by the small crowd here at the arena, that's okay because while the CIAA teams are playing inside, CIAA fans are playing outside. There are long lines of fans waiting at Charlotte's Uptown nightclubs, even in the middle of the afternoon. Uptown hotels are booked solid with supporters from a dozen different CIAA schools and at Charlotte's Uptown restaurants. It's like being in a store on Christmas Eve at 5.59 p.m. <laughs> Magnolia Lewis is a manager at Mertz Heart and Soul on South College Street, staying open up to 18 hours a day during the CIAA just to handle all that extra business. I say double at least our normal capacity um, because we're always cooking and we ordered extra and changed the menu around for the CIAA, so the chef is busy. And it really, it's a sporting event, but it's really one huge family reunion, or you could maybe call it homecoming party. Call it whatever you want. The Charlotte Regional Visitors Authority CEO Tom Murray says the CIAA is Charlotte's number one annual convention drawing up to 100,000 fans who spent more than $47 million in a single week. Not just last year or this year, but every year. You know, we're pretty excited about that and, um, and we're pleased uh, that they continue to want to be here. But when the music stops, <laughs> when CIAA week is over, how does Charlotte attract convention business here the rest of the year? So how was Charlotte doing? Haywood Sanders, author of the book Convention Center Follies, says that's a problem for a lot of cities like Charlotte, all spending big bucks, all competing for the same show. You build the convention center, you add a hotel, you add a NASCAR Hall of Fame and a ballroom, and what do you get? A bunch of empty hotel rooms. Sanders, speaking at the John Locke Foundation in Raleigh back in September, showed his audience the same slides that consultants showed the Charlotte City Council 18 years ago. Projecting conventions in Charlotte would book more than 528,000 hotel room nights every year, a prediction that today, 18 years later, still hasn't come true. So how many actual hotel room nights did Charlotte conventions book last year? 393,221. Welcome to the Democratic National Convention in 2012 in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
But the Visitors Authority says Charlotte's convention numbers did get a boost after the Democrats came to town two years ago. The DNC was a game changer for us, but it also created a mindset and got us out there in a way that we could never spend that much money marketing, letting people know where Charlotte is, what Charlotte's all about, and how wonderful Charlotte is, how beautiful our skyline is, and how walkable our downtown is. And so that's helped. The city is getting more and more attractive to visitors. The convention center is getting um, more and more business sent its way. Yeah, problem is, there's also competition for that business. The Visitors Bureau admits that when Charlotte's in the running for a convention, often so is Atlanta and Austin and Indy and Nashville and Dallas. So what do those five rival cities have that Charlotte doesn't? We need more hotel rooms. Our biggest problem right now is we're so successful with our hotels are full. The last recession really stopped hotel construction for a few years, maybe six years. And some cities now are getting into these mega hotels, thousand room hotels that we don't have yet. Charlotte's got a lot to savor. What Charlotte does have is this flashy video campaign. The Visitors Authority getting out Charlotte's message using money from Charlotte, Texas on hotel rooms and restaurant meals. Bigger events also receive Charlotte tax dollars directly in the form of incentives if they pick Charlotte over those other competing cities. And if you look at Charlotte and you see the success of the hotel industry, you look at the success of the restaurant industry. So my sense is that um, it's all well worth it and the industry is getting its return on investment. And then there's the CIAA, which gets at least $1.4 million a year in tax money the old-fashioned way. Every year, the Charlotte Visitors Authority writes them a big check for their scholarship fund, which is another reason why every year the CIAA keeps coming back to Charlotte at tournament time. And by the way, in case you were wondering, the CIAA tournament, all those tournament dollars, locked up here at the arena and here in Charlotte for at least the next five years. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. Not only is the CIAA tournament returning to Charlotte for years to come, the CIAA is also moving its league headquarters to Charlotte this summer. It's all part of a long-term deal between the league and the city, including another $100,000 in tax money from the Charlotte Regional Visitors Authority to help pay for CIAA's rent and moving expenses. Well, from investing in our economy to investing in our children, Project LIFT stands for Leadership and Investment for Transformation. The program is a partnership between private donors and Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. Now in its third year, the five-year plan aims to narrow the achievement gap in the West Charlotte Corridor by 2017. Carolina Impact's Sarah Batista visited a few schools to learn more about the program. I came here, I got the help I needed, and I was able to graduate on time. When Diamond Morris thinks about graduating from high school, it brings a smile to her face. But before she joined the Lyft Academy in Charlotte's West Side, she was in trouble academically. When I got to West Charlotte, I really wasn't comfortable. I wasn't really going to classes. I started missing a lot of days, and it started to add up. My grades began to drop, and I was failing, basically. In 10th grade, um, my father passed, and uh, Diamond and my father were very close. And I think that kind of took a toll on her, and then she stopped going to class. Diamond got behind on her schoolwork, and graduating with her class seemed nearly impossible. Then she heard about the Lyft Academy, a non-traditional high school created for at-risk students at West Charlotte High School needing one-on-one -on -one support. She got involved, and that's when things started changing. When I got here, I noticed that the environment was completely different from West Charlotte. It was a lot smaller. It was um, more motivation, more teachers trying to push us to get our work done. One-on-one -on -one help was provided. Credit recovery was provided. Kristen Ward was Diamond's English teacher. She immediately recognized Diamond's ability to learn and implemented teaching methods that worked with the teen's learning style. Diamond, I could tell right off the bat, was like a really smart, intelligent young lady. I think she might have been off track just because there were a lot of distractions at a traditional high school with a lot of students there. She came to the Lyft Academy, she was on fire. And um, she came home with homework and she was just really excited about doing what she needed to do to graduate. Diamond started taking more interest in her schoolwork and striving for better grades. Within a year, she was back on track and eventually graduated with her class. 
Her experience is one of hundreds of successful stories stemming from the Project Lift program. The five-year initiative began four years ago when business leaders started taking a closer look at low-performing schools across Mecklenburg County. They noticed a trend among some schools in West Charlotte that weren't performing well. They were chronically underperforming and had been for a long time. And so those community members um, got together and pooled resources and partnership with the district um, to bring about change in student achievement and in the community in these nine schools. Business and community members raised $55 million and focused the program around four pillars, talent, hiring quality teachers, time, offering extended tutoring and class hours, technology, bringing 21st century tools into the classroom, and community and parent engagement. The primary goal of the program is to improve math and reading scores as well as the graduation rate at West Charlotte High School. To accomplish this, they started investing more resources into the eight elementary and middle schools where students are enrolled before going to West Charlotte High School. Although the program is only in its third year, Watt says the graduation rate has already jumped from 54 percent to 78 percent. I think it really boils down to belief. Um, and the belief that regardless of where a child lives or the circumstances that they're born into, a quality education can really be an opportunity for a child to realize a dream or a vision for themselves and also to make the city of Charlotte become a better place. Project Lift not only gives students the extra help they need at school, the program also focuses on educating parents so they can work with their children at home. Show me how you use the ruler. Deborah Thompson has three children who range in age from 8 to 12. Her children attend year-round classes at Druid Hills, which is a Project Lift school. And Deborah also takes classes in her neighborhood twice a week as part of the Getting Ahead course. It makes me go home and it makes me it involved my kids more with what's going on because it's actually something to bring the family together. She says the classes push her to think outside the box. I used to just be stuck on, hey, I got a job, now I want a career. So now I'm teaching them that it's bigger than just a job. Anybody can get a job, but you have to work hard for a career. While the Project Lift program has been successful for many, there are still a number of challenges the program is targeting, including high teacher turnover, and no one knows for sure what will happen to the program after the five-year initiative ends. We're at a place now where we've been in it for two years. We're able to get a better idea of what's actually getting traction in our schools and what's working, and so we're in that decision-making process about what's next. But for now, Project Lift is keeping alive the hope for a quality education in Charlotte's west side. For Carolina Impact, I'm Sarah Batista reporting. Thanks so much, Sarah. Funding for Project Lift is provided by several businesses and organizations, including Bank of America Charitable Foundation, the Leon Levine Foundation, and the Knight Foundation. Well, Charlotte's infrastructure and quality of life is impressive to companies looking to expand here. But how do you share what our region offers to folks overseas who may not even know where we are on the map? Well, honorary consuls play a key role. And Charlotte actually has more than a dozen promoting not only the city, but the entire region. Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark introduces us to three honorary consuls and explains the vital role they play in building trade relations. For some, John Marino has a dream job. He's a professional brewmaster. His daily routine includes checking a complicated system of tanks and pipes at his microbrewery in South Charlotte. That's called sparging. It's now adding more liquid. He missed the beer he used to drink while living in Germany. So he opened a brewery producing world-class German-style beer. In the back of the old Mecklenburg brewery, employees pack bottles to ship to grocery stores and bars throughout the region. We have a very slow bottling line at the moment. It only does seven bottles a minute, but we have a new one on order that'll do 180 bottles a minute. Up front, you'll find a German thing Brauhaus where Marino and his staff serve up fresh cold beer from the tap. Klaus Becker says coming here reminds him of home. He moved from Germany to Charlotte 36 years ago to work. I am in the international steel trade. That means, for example, our concrete business right now is we are buying um, steel in China, ship it to Mexico. In addition to running his international business in South Park, Becker has another important role. He's the honorary consul of Germany. A consul is someone who represents another government or country in the territory of another. They help with things like obtaining a visa or notarizing documents, but they also help build business relations between two countries. I want to put Charlotte 
more on the political map with the German institutions in Washington and in Berlin. There are 3,500 German companies in the U.S., of which 500, or 20 percent, are located in the Carolinas. 200 are in the Charlotte region alone. And these are not Mickey Mouse companies. These are big companies. It's Bosch, that is ZF, which is not very famous, but it's the second largest automotive supplier in the world after Bosch. Um, there's Getrak, you know, who does um, um, gearboxes. And just like Germany, Italy also has a large presence in the Charlotte region. Claudio Corpano is the honorary consul of Italy. He travels to Italy several times a year, and while there, I have opportunity to tell the story about North Carolina and tell the story, the successful story, of the Italian companies that have moved to Charlotte. There are about 100 Italian companies in North Carolina. More than half are in Charlotte. But Corpano says we need to be doing more to let the world know what the region has to offer. The story is not out. It's not out as we want it to be. He says when most internationals think of the U.S., big cities like New York, San Francisco, Chicago, and Miami come to mind. Even honorary consuls who represent countries that don't have companies in Charlotte play a key role. By day, Chris Domini works for one of the big banks, but in his spare time, he serves as the honorary consul of Hungary for North and South Carolina. I meet a lot of people, and I try to engage in conversations that help improve relations between Hungary and the Carolinas. There are about 100 people from Hungary who live in Charlotte, but as far as the number of Hungarian businesses... In Charlotte, so far, not. We're working on getting a Hungarian business established here. While Domini encourages Hungarian investors to consider Charlotte, he says it's a two-way street. I encourage businesses here to look at Hungary if they look at Europe in general, to expand and see if that's a possible fit. Sven Gerzer is with the Charlotte Chamber, and he works closely with the 14 honorary consuls in our area. Hungary is, is in a sense, fairly new among the, the European Union countries that is starting to look outwards of, out, of Europe, out of Hungary and out of Europe. I think once we have the first one here, the second and third is, will follow a lot easier. Attracting more foreign-owned companies to Charlotte, Gerzer says, will make our local economy stronger. Well, international companies create jobs. They pay wages, they, they hire a lot of people, they pay taxes, they add significantly to the economy. 69,000 people in the Charlotte area are employed by foreign-owned companies. Even if you don't work for a company, your company might do business with that company because they're here. So it creates an another additional set of jobs and, and business opportunities for, for local domestic companies. And Charlotte has a growing international community. And more honorary consuls mean more conversations and discussions with regions outside of, of, of the United States. You can build business relations on that, and, and that certainly helps the bottom line. Back at the old Mecklenburg Brewery, owner John Marino gets ready for the lunch crowd. A number of his customers are originally from Europe, and they now live and work in Charlotte. Coming to the Brawl House reminds them of home. Marino says that's good for his business and the bottom line. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Reibenbark, reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. Joining me now is Alexis Gordon, the manager of Charlotte's Office of International Relations. Alexis, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about that a little bit, international relations and protocol for the city. Protocol sounds like it could be a little bit of a touchy subject. It can be. It's part of diplomacy and you know everyone thinks diplomacy is about being nice, making peace, but really it's about protecting your interests and if you boil it down it's about getting what you want. And when you look at it, protocol is just to make sure that you're not stabbing someone in the back while you're doing it. And it's a way to make sure that countries are working together and that countries are protecting their own interests while not hurting someone else's. How critical is the role of those consuls to trade with other countries in our area? They are very critical. Um, consuls can help kind of smooth the edges of the process. There's a lot of red tape when you look at trade. Uh, every country has different ways that they do tariffs. Every country has different ways that they do imports and exports and, and different laws and different regulations. And a consul can help you kind of find that path. They can kind of be your Sherpa. And they also can help you find out what's really best for your company as you're looking into another market. We saw in Jeff's story that we have over a dozen consuls in this area. Are you looking to add more? I understand Atlanta has a lot. Oh, Atlanta has a lot, and Atlanta doesn't just have honorary consuls like we have in Charlotte. They have full-fledged consulates, um, and Charlotte would love to add more. It, we actually have a full-fledged consulate for Mexico in Raleigh, 
um, but we would love to have something like that here in Charlotte. We are looking at what kind of countries would be best to bring to Charlotte for consoles, and part of it has to happen organically. A country has to feel that Charlotte is someplace that they want to be. They might want to be here because they have a lot of citizens that belong to their country that are living in Charlotte doing business, business owners, or who might be here for school um, and because they want to help them be able to vote back home absentee. They want to be able to help give them birth certificates if they have children that are born here that they want to keep citizens of their country. And so if they have a lot of need, they will look into Charlotte more. And that's why we've actually seen an influx of honorary consuls because they can help do that as well. So they can help kind of make it easier for you to get things done at the consulate. And that's why we're trying to grow more of them here. And Charlotte is becoming a very diverse area. How is that helpful from an economic standpoint as well? It's so helpful economically because diversity really helps with creativity. It's something that people and companies will look for. When they see a diverse workforce, they're looking at there's a diversity of ideas, there's a diversity of culture. We really live in a global market and they want to see that. And so having consoles here can help with that. Having um, immigrants can help with that as well. And, and as we grow as a global market, it makes us more competitive which is what we all have to be in, in the current climate of business these days. Let's talk a little bit about cosmopolitan savvy. That is a very interesting word. Help, help me understand what it means. Yeah, uh, Charlotte wants every, you hear a lot of times, you know, being globally competitive, and that is something that you want in your city. But the idea of being cosmopolitanly savvy is, is a little bigger than just globally competitive. It means that you understand how everything works within a city, how everything works within that global system. Um, a lot of things are urbanizing, and cities are really bringing up a lot more power. Um, you know, it's not just about going through the State Department anymore. Uh, London has their own representatives in Brussels. And so when you look at that, and you look at that idea of being globally minded and having a city where people are globally minded, it really helps us a lot in the international market. You know, we saw in that story just saying so many people from abroad may not even know where Charlotte is on the map to determine whether or not they should bring a business here would be quite a stretch. So how are, how are the consuls helping us uh, define Charlotte as a intentional place to live and work and do business? What they do is that they reach out to their contacts in the countries that they represent. Some of them are actually from those countries. Some of them have worked in those countries for years. Others have different relationships that they have formed and bonds that they have formed with those countries. With, with those bonds come contacts, come friends that own a business. Maybe that business is in um, Czechoslovakia or actually that's an old-fashioned country name. Maybe they're in the Czech Republic. Maybe they're in Ireland. Uh, maybe they're in China. And what they can do is they can say, you know, Charlotte would fit your company really well, and this is why. And that's what, that's what their job is to do, is their job is to help make that personal connection with a country and companies in that country with Charlotte so that people know where we are. And people like to do business with people they know. Exactly. And friends and relationships. Alexis Gordon, Manager of International Relations for the City of Charlotte, thanks so much for shining a light on this very interesting topic. Thank you. Changing gears now, the closest I ever got to making pottery was playing with Play-Doh as a kid. But I've always admired the artistry in clay creations. Functional and decorative pottery is produced all over North Carolina. One organization in Charlotte called Clayworks offers a place for those who want to learn the craft. Senior producer Rick Fitz discovered Clayworks also serves the needs of a diverse group of people. Clayworks is the fourth largest nonprofit teaching facility in the nation. And what's really interesting about Clayworks is we call it the magic door. So as people come through the door here at Clayworks, they're going to be working with like-minded people that like to work together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to brush clear on this rim and then on these raised surfaces to kind of highlight those textures on there. And I've been teaching here for I think 15 years now. Um, and there's so many different things that keep me coming back. I've got a wonderful um, group of students that have been with me for quite some time now and I really consider them friends as well as students. We have a great time. I started because clay has always been fun and it's just nice to come and learn new things and learn about how to throw and do slab building which is what we were doing today. It's so wonderful to see what other people make. You get great ideas, see all kinds of new and different things that are that they've come up with that you can use in your work 
or they see something that you've done and like that idea and you see it taken to another level. This is the butter mold here. So the way that works is you pack butter into it. It is a teaching community as well as a community of artists. Uh, it's a space uh, for artists to work and have the sense of camaraderie with other artists. There's a lot of um, potters that come here that have their own studios and they come and take classes just to be with other people that have the same interests. Every class with Greg is fabulous because he's so um, open and intuitive the way he works. It's all about throwing on the wheel and working with the clay to um, finalize and make something really special that was utilitarian and an art piece at the same time. It's an opportunity to be around people with the vastness of the knowledge that's out there to kind of get it into one location where it's accessible. still look peach. Here at Clayworks I am the studio manager and I also go out and do a lot of programs with um, different populations in the community. Our partnership with InReach is important because it continues our outreach program and brings disabled adults into our facility to work in our regular studio. Missy is my number five daughter. I have five daughters and she's the last daughter at home. Clayworks has brought Missy into the art world and has surrounded her with ideas and love and patience and kindness that she has grown tremendously. It exposes people to a different medium that maybe they're not used to working with and helps them to express themselves and use the clay as a way to speak if they don't have the vocabulary that can help them um, voice their opinions. She learns a lot by just, just being here, and so do I. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing. There are many, many ceramic artists in Charlotte, but Clayworks offers a place for them all to be together, work together, talk together, and be creative together. Thanks so much, Rick. To learn more about Clayworks and its many programs, visit our website at pbscharlotte.org. Well, here's something you may not know. This year marks the 50th anniversary of your public television station, WTVI PBS Charlotte. It's a real honor to lead this organization, and we wanted to do several things throughout the year that were very special for our 50th. So first, we've invited New York Times bestselling author and Inc. Magazine's number one leadership expert in the world, John Maxwell, to come and teach on his new book, Do Out This Fall, called Intentional Living. I've been a fan of his work for over 15 years. You may not see yourself as a leader, but we all have influence over others, and that's really all leadership is, influence. Here are just a few things you'll learn at the event. First, how to discover your purpose in life. The difference between good intentions and intentional living. And what's the one thing that adds the most value to your life, and you'll learn how to live the four steps to significance. We'd love for you to join us at this fundraising event. Thursday, May 21st, from 9 a.m. to 10.30 in the morning. Now, there's even a chance John could answer your burning leadership question. He'll do 30 minutes of Q&A at the end, and our cameras will be recording the entire seminar for distribution nationally to PBS stations this fall. Ticket information is available on our website at pbscharlotte.org. And before we leave you tonight, we'd like to encourage you to friend us on Facebook at WTVI Charlotte. By doing that, you'll have the opportunity to win monthly prizes. Don't forget, you can also friend me at Amy Burkett. And remember, we'd love to have your story ideas, so please email them to carolinaimpact at wtvi.org. Well, from all of us here at WTVI, your public television station, thanks so much for joining us, and we hope to see you back here again next time. Good night, my friends. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by the Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact.
a production of WTBI-PBS Charlotte.